Hello, this is Dr. Moyer. This is week five, and we are talking about Montessori's educational philosophy this week. So a little bit of background information first about Maria Montessori. Um, she was born in Italy, 1870 to 19, 1952. She was born to a civil servant father, um, but had a mother with high expectations and hoped that Maria would go as far as a woman could go. Um, and she pretty much did. She became the first female physician in Italy, which of course during that time was a really big deal. Um, unfortunately, she had a child out of wedlock after she, and before she was married, and she had to send away um, her child to a wet nurse because if she kept him, he would have destroyed her career at that time. She did visit him, um, but the experience threw her into a bit of a crisis during which she focused on her faith to get her through. Her first professional interest was in, um, at the time it was called mental retardation. She noted that institutionalized children hungered for experiences and she felt that they were teachable given the right methods and tools. She, and that line of thinking be, kind of became the base for Montessori education. Um, so she used this foundation to develop the Montessori principles. She opened a school in Rome for impoverished children, which included sons and daughters of um, laborers, beggars, uh, unemployed like laborers, beggars, prostitutes, and criminals. And she called it Children's Home. And this is where the Montessori principles were put into action. And the main idea behind Montessori is that we cannot um, simply teach children what we think they have to know. This will only lead to frustration. We need to let children guide us, find out what natural tendencies and interests that they have, and then they will take over and be interested and develop concentration and um, learn all about it. So... Um, the her concepts were really were really radical actually and she developed all these theories and ideas and she was at the time she was one of the most famous women in the news during 1913 but truly it was too much for the times um, within five years she was all but forgotten except by a small band of followers and there are still followers even today <laughs> in the 1960s her work began to come back and catch the attention of psychologists, teachers, educators, and the general public. Revitalization of her principles. So her theory of development. Um, she had several concepts that we need to cover and talk about. Um, the sensitive period for order. She had sensitive period was important to her. Um, she talked about these as genetically programmed blocks of time where the child is especially uh, ready or eager to master particular tasks. And she had several of them that she talked about. Um, she, the first one was a period for order. During the first three years of life, the child has a strong need for order. And she observed this by watching children, how they like to put objects back in their place. They like to put things away, um, they like to organize their area and she even gave the example or she didn't but the book gave you an example of watching a child six month old become upset because an umbrella was placed in the table and the baby became very um, upset and couldn't be calmed until the mother picked up the umbrella and put it where it should be so this order is different than the kind of order we experience as adults um, as adults, order provides us with external pleasure, but for the child at that age, it's essential. And so this was a big deal in, I mean, her thinking is just give children a place to organize or give them toys and objects that they can put in order, you know, work with it, work with what's going on instead of just trying to force what you think they need to learn. Then there was a sensitive period for details. Between one and two years, she says children focus on small details. You can see this if you're reading a book to a child. Um, you're pointing things out as you're reading, 
whatever book it is to them. And you might point out the princess and the dragon and whatever else is, is big in the pictures or even the focus of the pictures. When children will, po will look and point at tiny little things like a, a ladybug in the corner. And you might be thinking, my goodness, how did they even spot that? Well, Maria Montessori would say that's because they focus on small details. They look at the smaller things in pictures, trying to fill their knowledge with all of the details. They notice little things like insects in the house that completely escape adult notice because we're not looking that way. Uh, the sensitive period for hands occurs between 18 months and three years. She noticed that children are constantly grasping objects. They enjoy opening and shutting things, putting things in containers and pouring them out. And that's why many times children will be content with just having somebody pull their Tupperware out of the cupboard, put them on the floor and let them play with it because that's what they want to do naturally is what Montessori would say. So let them do it. The sensitive period for walking um, what's important about children are born ready to walk and they want to learn how to do it, but they walk for the sake of walking, not to get to places. And this is kind of an important point that Montessori wanted to make. Because when we rush children, if we're taking children somewhere and allowing them to walk and we want to get there in a hurry and we pick them up and carry them, many times they'll become upset. And that's because they enjoy walking. They enjoy learning it and they enjoy developing it and walking in to perfection as best they can. Um, then it looks like I might have cut off the sensitive period for language from the PowerPoint, but she does talk about the sensitive language, I'm sorry, sensitive period for language and how it occurs um, up until about the time children are six years old, and she, she called it nothing short of amazing, that children absorb language almost unconsciously, and then it's a more conscious kind of imprinting is what she called it. But really, she wanted to point out that children just learn language by listening to it, um, and that they're, they're at, that's because they're at that sensitive period for being able to absorb it. It's also why they can learn two languages and master them when they're that age. Montessori would say that education begins in the home. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Um, children are driven by an inner impulse to master certain experiences and that the goal of the adult or the caretaker, the mother, or the father is to assist this process. So par parents and caretakers are the first educators and they need a certain attitude to help uh, respect what children are trying to master. It's not the parent's job to direct their learning, but to allow them the tools and the environment so that they can learn naturally on their own. Um, watch what, you're, what they're naturally interested in. Um, be open to that. Allow them, when you see them pursue a certain interest, give them the tools so that they can continue to pursue it. Um, allow children to walk where they choose with guidance. They can stop and enjoy new sights and master the skill of walking. If a parent focuses on trying to teach a child to walk correctly, it can give them the sense that their efforts, their own efforts are inadequate in their own instincts. Um... Don't criticize children. Uh, we are a society that focuses a lot or heavily on criticism as a way of teaching. Montessori would say that criticism only focuses on what somebody did wrong instead of celebrating what they're doing right. And that we have to control our reactions. The point is to allow children to teach themselves, not to try to direct their teaching. It's counterintuitive to how the school system is set up today. <clears throat> the Montessori school, however, is set up for exactly this. At about the age of two and a half, children can enter Montessori school. They'll learn in the same class with children anywhere from two and a half to up to the age of six. And this is because Montessori enjoyed that 
I'm sorry, observed that children actually enjoy this age range assortment. They like it. Um, there is this idea of independent mastery. The teacher does not direct, instruct, drill, or otherwise take charge. Instead, the whole idea is to give the child chances for them to learn things on their own. So the school environment should contain the right materials for learning and mastery at very various sensitive periods. So Montessori educators need to be aware of these sensitive periods, what's important, and children will work on these things enthusiastically on their own. Montessori observed that when children find a task that really engages them, they work with what she called amazing concentration. They're very focused. Um, I'm kind of giggling because I'm thinking about the example in the book where she actually tried to disrupt a child's work and even moved the child on top of a table, but the child just kept on doing what they were doing. Um, she couldn't break their concentration. And she would say this is good, that they'll concentrate and they'll work at it until they master it. And that they, they achieve this sense of peace while they're doing this. They'll work on things over and over, and this process is called normalization. And then once they've achieved it, they, they experience this peace. And that's why it's critical to give them free choice. Um, for example, the two-year-old will want to straighten the room. So give them things, give them things to organize with, allow them to do that. Um, give them cabinets, help them fulfill their inner needs. And then you can introduce tasks to children if they seem ready for it, but it needs to be done in a very delicate manner, not forced. And if the child isn't ready, they won't engage. So if that happens, then just delicately take the task away. Um, task being like puzzles and stuff. And the teacher is thought of as passive, just observes. Rewards and punishments don't have a place in the Montessori classroom. Teachers trust that if they pay attention to children's spontaneous tendencies, which are, of course, tied to these sensitive periods, they can find materials for the children to work on, but the children will do it out of inherent drive, not external judgment. The external judgment being like praise, rewards, and punishment. Um, and she even designed toys with a built-in control of error, so in the book, the, the book discussed a cylinder toy that helps teach children about spatial dimensions. And if children play with it correctly or organize it or, or try to master it correctly, then all of the cylinders will have a place. But if one is left over, then they haven't done it right. And that the child will notice this and want to do it right and will continue trying until they get it right. And that's when they're involved in that uh, amazing concentration and they're trying to normalize themselves to this task. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I've given you some examples here because we will... Let me see if I can make the mouse do this. I can. <laughs> Children are going to want to master these tasks like tying shoes, buttoning shirts, snapping, lacing, zipping, buckling. Um, and I'll talk about the reading in a little bit, but they don't have the fine motor skills to do that immediately. So give them bigger versions that they can practice on and learn to master. And that would be one of these tasks that she's referring to. She called this gradual preparation. Um, and so children want to be independent, but sometimes they just, they're not ready, developmentally ready. So she tries to create toys that gave children a chance to practice. And then when it came down to it, they were able to master the task once they had developed the skills. And it didn't have to just be these like tying frames or zipping frames. You could give them unrelated tasks that help them learn to develop their fine motor skills, like peeling vegetables, holding a pencil, etc. And that these are things, again, that children are going to want to do so you're not forcing them to do something they don't want to do. And it seems unrelated, but it is related. When it came to reading and writing, um, Montessori said that by age four, children are ready to learn to read and write with enthusiasm. 
and this is the sensitive period for language. But she pointed out that writing is easier for children because they it's designed to suit their style of learning. And what she meant by this was what I have here for the example of the sandpaper letters. Um, letters that are made of sandpaper on a wooden block so you can see the child can feel them. And that's really important because that's a skill that children engage in by themselves. We don't force them. So being able to trace the letters and then teaching children to sound them out, it appeals to their sense of touch and their learning of sound. And they will do it over and over until they master it. And again, there's that built-in control for error because once their fingers wander off the sandpaper, they're on the wood. So by doing it over and over, they're learning to make the letter C. And they learn the sound that the letter C makes. And they do this with all the letters of the alphabet. Once they've mastered these, Montessori says that they will um, write all day. <laughs> she called it an explosion of writing, that they want to write, they will write, and that we need to provide them with the tools to do so. And then when they go to pick up a book, they're much better prepared to learn to read because they've mastered writing. She said it was easier this way, and that a child that's attended Montessori school or has been raised with Montessori principles will say, I just picked up a book and started reading it because they've already mastered the language. Um, typical teachers give children lessons and then criticize them for mistakes, but Montessori would say that criticism is humiliating and it's pointless. The whole point is to help the child develop a positive attitude, to feel independent and to trust their instincts. And so you don't want to discourage that. And misbehavior is not typically an issue. Um, children are not permitted to abuse the, the task materials or each other. But the way that this process is conducted, it kind of has that natural um, built-in control for error that she talked about. So if a child is concentrating on a task and another child bothers them, Usually they'll just go away because the other child is so involved in concentrating on the task they're working on, they're not going to show that other child any interest. And children at a very young age like to play by themselves anyways. They might engage in side-by-side -side play, but they're not, they haven't quite moved into that playing with each other yet. And so if a child does continue to try to bother the, children work, the child working on the task, the teacher might separate the child and let them observe the value of that child working so hard and, and concentrating on their own and so that the child will want to, the one that is, had been bothering them, will want to do that on their own without interference. And Montessori would say that if children continue to misbehave, it's because they're unfulfilled. You're not giving them the right materials or tools they need new materials, they may need a new task to be introduced to, but that they will want to concentrate and normalize and learn tasks if you give them the right tools, the right environment at the right time. See, I'm sorry, I have a cold, I think. <laughs> haven't been doing so well. I haven't been feeling well this week. Anyways, you don't care about that, or maybe you do, but back to the <laughs> lecture. Um, Nature and education, Montessori highly emphasized the importance of nature. And what she noticed was that when children were outside and in nature, they became very quiet, introspective, and they developed these amazing powers of concentration and patience. So they were able to sit there and be content. Um, and I actually saw an example of this last summer. I went to visit my sister she has a, I guess he's eight now, so he must have been seven, seven-year-old um, nephew named Jacob. And he's very, he's kind of ahead of himself, like as far as learning, very smart. But he's also a, a bit high strung and has to be entertained constantly. Doesn't do well with just um, sitting quietly in a corner. And this is probably because that's not the way that they had raised him. But last summer when we were at my father's 
70th birthday party in Maine, all the children were given fishing poles and taught to fish. And it was like, I don't even know how to describe it. Jacob was, he was in, not only was he concentrating and he was trying to normalize. I mean, he was completely content to sit out there for hours trying to catch a fish. And when he did catch one, I mean, he was so happy. He learned how to clean them. You know, he's, his dad taught him how to cook and so that he actually got to see and contribute to the whole um, cycle of life with catching food. It was actually really quite fascinating. <laughs> and I didn't really link it to Montessori until I was think creating this lecture and thinking about it. Um, but, so Montessori said that that's what nature does. The sight of the flower or an insect, animal, water, that it benefits the child emotionally. And it, it touches them emotionally. It, it touches them inside. And they, they want to try to tend to pl plants and flowers. They want to go fishing and help with catching food. Um, they want to take care of animals too and are capable, which is often why you'll see that classrooms have pets. When it came to fantasy and creativity, the Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus, Montessori did not encourage fantasy. This is kind of one of the biggest criticisms of Montessori. She said that creativity must always be tied to reality and that fantasy, fairy tales, fables, and cartoons um, are a product of a mind that loses touch with reality and that it can develop mistrust between a child and the adult because it's not real. She encouraged drawing and she thought that being creative was important and would have tasks, of course, related to creativity, but they were tied to very specific skills. So she wouldn't have a child do free drawing. She would want them to be learning how to discriminate among forms and color. A little different attitude. Um, the element, most of Montessori's principles focus on before the child is six, but she did actually develop some fairly detailed programs for elementary education. Still, it's about um, education should be about what children want to know. Children should be allowed to conduct their own research. Um, they can be given stories and films to design uh, that are designed to stimulate their interest, but that they should also want to do their own research to learn. And she encouraged children to be able to, from between the ages of six and 12, to go to museums and zoos and planetariums, ponds, libraries, artist studio, studios, botanical gardens, etc., often on their own. Um, and to engage in, in that research is what she called it, where they would learn about these things by exploring. It was important to create a safe and favorable environment. You don't want to put the child in danger, but you also want to encourage exploration. Um, and she would, again, mix up the ages so there wouldn't just be all seven-year-olds together, all eight-year-olds. And I, can't, I have another example of this. I had a friend, um, a childhood friend, that ended up going to what was a Montessori school, but I didn't realize it at the time. I just thought it was private school, whatever. Um, I lived hmm, about half an hour from her, and sometimes I would go and stay the night and once in a while, my mom would let me stay during school nights, and I would just go to school with Kim. Kim was her name. And um, we would actually have to, <laughs> I thought this was a pretty big deal. I think I was like maybe nine. We would have to, the first time I did this, we would get on a city bus by ourselves from Hamden, Maine, to take it to Orono, Maine, which is where the school was located. Now, this whole trek involved changing buses several times and we would um, do this all by ourselves no no adult supervision Kim was very confident and independent about it wasn't worried um, of course it was new to me and I was a little freaked but she wasn't at all and when we got to the school it was like a big house it wasn't like a you know concrete school building and the classrooms, they were just so strange to me. 
we went into one and there were just couches and bean bags and pillows and chairs everywhere. And of course, various, you know, books along the wall for people to do their own research. Um, they also had pretty much a working farm attached to this house. And Kim even kept her horse there. You could board if you had a horse and she had a horse. So her and I went horseback riding <laughs> during the school day. Um, and we cleaned the horse's stall. We brushed and fed. I mean, we did very detailed care of the horses. It's obviously left an impact on me because I remember details so clearly. And then the rest of the day we participated in a, in a play that the students were writing together. Um, so there was probably five or six of us sitting in a circle writing this play. And we acted it out. We went and found costumes. Um, and th that was her day at school. And then we got on the bus at the end of the day, the city bus again. It took us about an hour to get back. And we, we went home for dinner. And it, it was just such a bizarre experience, but one that was so peaceful, so calm, um, and one I will never forget. I ended up going with her to school a few more times after that, and the experiences were the same. I mean, they were always just really, really rich experiences that left a huge impact on me, and I enjoyed it. And we, we did actually one time walk over to the planetarium. It, we, the school was located near the University of Maine. We were probably about, I would guess, a quarter of a mile. And when we were getting ready to go, we just told somebody we were going to the planetarium to see a show. There were a handful of us that went together, and we, d we just went. No adults. I mean, this was just, this was so bizarre to me. But again, Kim was so confident. And the adult that I observed today, how she is today, she's, she's a very confident woman. She's very independent. She's very successful. Um, her focus isn't on corporate America, of course. What her job is, is she is, you're going to laugh, because um, it fits right in with Montessori. She, is a, she has her own business, and she helps people to organize their life. So not only, like, organize their house, but organize bills, or organize everything. Um, and she's paid well for it. And, and the way that she accomplishes this is that she will go live with the family for a few weeks and observe. And then she will start to help them make changes. Um, and doesn't that just sound like Montessori <laughs> principles? It's crazy. Okay, back to so that uh, just a really good example of that. And how these children how they end up secondary school um montessori didn't give a lot of detail about methods but she did offer some thoughts um that were still consistent with the way that my friend kim experienced school she said that adolescents want to improve society and they want to make a difference they're trying you know they're practicing being adults and they that we should encourage this by offering them a way to do that and the way that she talked about doing that was having students run a coffee bar, a business, um, some type of restaurant, anything where they can learn all these different skills. And it isn't just about math and ordering products. It's about everything. It's about the interaction with other humans. It's about merchandising. It's about presenting. It's about color. It's about um, just, you know, the whole, the whole thing is important. And so here, if you click on this in your own PowerPoint, you will go to a news story about students that run a coffee shop. It's pretty interesting. Um, and that's exactly what Montessori would say they should be doing to learn. As far as evaluation, I kind of already gave you a heads up about the um, fantasy. So Montessori was... Well, I just knocked over my microphone. Montessori was the first to recognize the importance of learning tasks. So she was the first person to say that. And when we look at research regarding how effective it is, children that experience Montessori schools score as good or better than children from typical schools. And what's really cool is that if you observe, anyone who observes a Montessori classroom will come away saying, wow, it was really peaceful and quiet and the children were very busy doing their own thing. I used to babysit a couple kids named Nathan and Ethan, 
the first time I walked in their house, um, if you ever did any babysitting, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I expected them to be all crazy and, oh, who's this? And they weren't like that at all. They barely looked up. They were, they had a library in their house. Um, the mom was so cool, so cutting edge. And she was like, uh, they're in the other room reading. And she introduced us and they looked up and said, hello. They were very polite, but they went back to reading. And I babysat probably four hours that day. They read the entire time. This was, this was unheard of as a babysitter in my small town. Um, and I later did find out they attended Montessori school. So Montessori children do read and they spell particularly well. That's a very, it's a skill that they master because of those letters. But the most important things that they master are concentration, confidence, and independence. That's what Montessori would say. And so that would be key. That's what she was looking for as adults. She was the first theorist to argue for sensitive periods of development, which we now know are true and critical. Um, but she did not discourage innovation. She did not encourage free play and free drawing. And she even said that we, you know, we, children have to deal with reality. But research does show that children enjoy fantasy. They enjoy engaging in fantasy. It relaxes them. Um, and if they're working out something that is the focus of a movie or a book, um, that they will read it over and over and over. <laughs> kind of like they're doing the, you know, they're getting that concentration and mastering that task because they, they're applying it to their own life. Um, and that they understand it's fantasy and they get it. And that it does have a purpose um, that children need to play, need to be free. But it just wasn't something that she encouraged. I mean, this was quite a while ago, so <laughs> I guess we can, we can cut her some slack and she could be wrong on, on maybe one thing. But that is Montessori principles. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, sorry for my mistakes knocking over the mic and getting carried away with my story of Kim. But I think it's important. I'll help you remember about it. Okay, that's all.